Welcome to the Zami Nobla National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for Black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's been a long, long time. Have you missed me as much as I have missed you? Well, Sorry for that break in our podcast production. We had a very busy summer that involves some complicated technology issues that had to be resolved, as well as a hectic summer schedule that took me away from the work that I've been doing with the Zami Noble podcast. But never fear, because we're back on track. And I am with you and you're with me. And that's the most important thing about it, right? In our absence, we celebrated an anniversary, our anniversary, where we have produced over a year's worth of incredible stories centered on older Black lesbians. I hope you have enjoyed all of the episodes we've produced, and we have so many more that we've been working on in our absence. Uh, In the next few weeks, you're going to be just titillated with some great stories that I've compiled, and I can't wait to share them with you. I thought we'd start our comeback today with the talk I gave at the First Existentialist Congregation here in Atlanta, Georgia. I gave it this summer. It was entitled Things I Learned from Podcasting. All the wonderful, wonderful insights I've learned from doing this work, this labor of love. In addition to the talk, I have included an outtake. There are so many wonderful stories, but we have such a limited amount of time, so we can't include everything we capture from our guests. So I thought I would share with you one of the outtakes I mentioned in my talk. You'll have to wait until the end to see what it is. Surprise, surprise. Without further ado, here is our latest podcast release, Things I Have Learned from podcasting. Good morning, First E. Good morning. morning. It is so good to be in community. I want to spend a few minutes just talking about things I've learned from podcasting. As Libby shared with you, I am the host and producer of a podcast and I've learned some things. So we'll spend a few minutes talking about that. Guest quote. Intro music fade in. Angela speaks. (laughs) Welcome to the Zami Nobla podcast, the national organization of black lesbians on aging. We are your sound source for black lesbian history. And I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. Intro music fades out. Opening comments. Guest interview. Interlude music fade in. Interlude music fade out. Closing comments. Exit music fade in. Exit music fade out. If you've listened to the Zami Nobla podcast, then you know that is our format. One trailer, 22 episodes uploaded, and one currently in production. How many of you, by saying yes, have heard an episode of our podcast? Yes. How many of you listen to podcasts? Yes. How many of you don't know what a podcast is? Okay. (laughs) The great thing about a podcast is that it is, in your mind, think about a radio show that you can play any time of the night or day. You don't have to wait for it to come on the airwaves. You can just log in or go to a podcast directory, uh, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and listen to your favorite podcast. Think about this as a 
digital story or a dig digital news show. We still have a lot of work to do in terms of helping people understand what podcasting is because the survey says that there are a lot of folks who don't understand what podcasts are and how to best access them. I've been interested in podcasting for a very long time and one of the things I understood as I was listening is that I didn't hear a lot of me in the pod sphere. I didn't hear a lot of podcasts by black women. I didn't hear a lot of podcasts by older women. I didn't hear a lot of podcasts created by people with disabilities. And I certainly didn't hear any podcasts by persons at all of those intersections. And so I said to myself, I'm enjoying all of these incredible podcasts, but I am not here. My stories aren't being told. I am invisible in the pod sphere. So a little about over a year ago, I went to Zami Nobla. I went to the board and I said, I have a great proposition for you. Why don't we create a podcast? We meaning me. <laughs> and they bought it hook, line, and sinker because they too understood the power of having your story told. Remember our tagline is, we are a sound source for black lesbian history. And our goal is to share our stories because one of the things I know to be true in the world is that stories are so important. Your story is important and it needs to be told. If we are immortal in this world, if there's a chance for us to be immortal, it is only through the way in which our stories interact and the stories of others. It's the stories we tell of Uncle Emerson. It's the stories we tell of Aunt C and Aunt Froney. It's the stories we tell of Mama and Daddy and how they impacted our lives. And if you can find yourself in someone's story, you'll never die because you'll always be remembered as a story is told and retold and told. So I understood something about the power of story and the board understood something about the power of story and so we decided to embark upon this creative adventure. One that I had sorely underestimated the work it would take to do. <laughs> Our first episode was the guest, Angela Denise Davis, being interviewed by her computer. <laughs> I was interviewed by my computer with the synthetic voice, Kate, because I thought it was important for our listeners to understand who was collecting and editing and producing these stories. I wanted people to know that me and all of my intersections were so interested and concerned and excited about sharing the stories that my story was a part of it as well. So Kate only did an interview with me of 25 minutes or so. Everybody else got 50, uh, 60, but Kate was upset because I didn't pay her. <laughs> so my interview was the shortest one of the bunch so far. But what I discovered when I started interviewing other guests is that I was honored to hear these incredible women tell their stories, to share with me and our listening audience details of their lives, journeys of their careers, the ways in which they had shaped community and, and family. And after every interview, I would say, oh, that was the best. I would tell my partner, Marianne Adams, who's executive director of Zambian Number, I said, babe, let me tell you, oh, that last one, it was the best. <laughs> and it really was. Because after I did each interview, we collected more stories 
And as the folks say, it got gooder and gooder. <laughs> and we understood that we really were collecting an archive of black lesbian history. Now, I'm about to do something people say you should never do, and that's to name a few names. Because invariably, you're going to miss someone, and I can't name all of our 21 guests. But I can name a few. Because I think that what their stories highlight, along with the stories of the other woman, are some of the things I've learned about podcasting. And the most important thing I've learned, I've already said, our stories are so important and you can't keep your story to yourself. You've got to share it. Sometimes we're part of communities where we are told, don't tell your story. Shh. Don't tell them about that aspect of your story. Someone may judge you. Someone may criticize you. Someone may think about you differently. Shh. Keep it to yourself. We've got to share our stories. Our stories tell us that we're not alone. Our stories tell us that we've made it. We've made it uh, through hard times and good times. And our stories connect us to other people. So overwhelmingly, that was the, the best thing I've learned over these past 11 months or so. You have got to tell your story. You can't keep it to yourself. What did I learn from our guests? I think about the interview I did with Tracy Trey. If you know Tracy Trey, you know she is a gifted and generous woman. I had her on in January. And I enjoyed talking to her because our episode really dealt with how do we talk about blindness and visual impairment and civil rights and all the ways in which we move in this world at our intersections as blind black lesbians. She's part of my tribe. And as we were talking, it came very clear to me that the thing I learned from her in that podcast episode was the fact that you cannot assume you know someone's story. You cannot assume that you know someone's story. We were talking about how we would move in the world with our white canes and people would either rush to assist us and pull us down into bus seats or push us across city streets, not knowing what type of assistance we needed. But what really got to me was when she said, yes, you know, people will come up to me and say, oh, Tracy, you know, you can do so much in this world. You know, if you will go back and get your GED and you can go to college and you can graduate and you can do something in this world. And as I said, Trey is both gifted and generous and they didn't know the punchline of the story. Trey has a law degree. <laughs> but they assumed they knew something about her story because of the fact that she walked in the world with her guide dog or her white cane. How dare we assume we know something about someone's story just because of the way they look. They're black, I know their story. She's a woman, I know her story. He's an immigrant, I know his story. I've learned we cannot assume that we know someone's story. The next thing I learned, very interestingly, was with one of our guests, Marissa Penderman. She was here about a year and a half ago and she preached on Who Broke the Moon? A beautiful sermon where she talked about how she dealt with the loss of her son. I was so moved by her talk here at First D, I said, you know, would you be willing to be a guest on our podcast and to talk about grief? She said, sure. And if you know Marissa, you know she is full of heart. 
She's a pastor. She's witty. She's wise. She's a social justice advocate. And during our conversation, I asked her, I said, have you always been this way? (laughs) Have you always been so loving and so kind, so tender, so to the point, so clear? And she told me about how when she was a kid, she was a mean kid. And some of that meanness came out of trauma she suffered from physical and sexual abuse. And we were talking and the interview got longer and longer and like with many interviews, I had to cut something out. And there were about 10 minutes of the interview I cut out and it contained that piece where she was talking about how she made a decision to change, to be somebody different, to be somebody better because she wanted something else out of the world. And I cut that 10 minutes out and I uploaded the episode and I went back to her later and said, you know, I, I got to just put this 10 minutes some other place in. I have another podcast. Can I put it in that? <laughs> It's still on the cutting room floor, so to speak, because I didn't get a chance to put it in. But, but what that taught me is that there are other parts of people's story we don't know. You may look at me and you see me now, but you don't know what my life was like 15 years ago when my vision was 2020 and life was different. We don't know all of people's story, we know the parts we see now. So many times we don't know someone's yesterday and we can't really judge what tomorrow's gonna look like, but all we have is now. There's so many other dimensions of people's story. And what a gift it is if someone sits and tells you the fullness of who they are. I learned when I interviewed Midget that some stories have to be marked explicit. <laughs> With iTunes, you, you have to mark if something's clean or explicit. Midget is a writer of Rada because she lives in San Francisco. She's in her 80s. And I said, oh my gosh, this is the first episode we have to mark explicit because she's using the P word. <laughs> Well, I learned more from her than that. What I learned from Midget is that we are always capable of shaping our story. At the beginning of the episode, her quote was how she talked about telling women in their 40s and 50s, look at your life now, she said. Look at your life now. And think about where you want to be in your 60s and 70s and 80s. Do you still want to be working the job you have? Do you still want to be living the life that you have? She said, you can change it now. You can make a difference now. It's so important when we learn that we can shape our story today. The things that we're doing now affect our tomorrow and we can choose to make a decision to do something different so that our tomorrow may be different. You don't have to do the same thing tomorrow that you did today. If you're a workaholic today, you don't have to be a workaholic tomorrow. If you don't care for your health today, you you don't have to not care for your health tomorrow. If you don't make time in your relationships to make those connections, to build and create those stories, you don't have to follow that pattern tomorrow. You can start today and shift your story. Now, every podcaster will probably expound upon the last point I'm going to make. Because I, I'd heard it said as I was doing all of my research on podcasting before I began this venture, and I would Log it as information, didn't know whether or not it was true. But the saying is that some of the best material you get 
is after you press the stop button on your recorder. Some people said this is so true that they would tell a guest, okay, thank you, we finished, they would let the recording go on and keep recording as they're saying goodbye to the person. I teased my partner, I tell her, I said, you know, you Southerners, you have what I call a Southern goodbye. <laughs> it takes you 30 or 60 minutes to say goodbye. I'm from the Midwest, when we say goodbye, we mean it, bye. But what I discovered in those 30 or 60 minutes I'm talking with my guests after I've pressed the stop button is that I get some of the most intimate details, some of the most delicious reflections. And I think that's so because they've had a chance to be in conversation with me and they've been reflecting about what we've talked about and they're comfortable and then when I press stop and they know we finish, they want to continue the conversation because they know how important it is to tell their story to someone. And then I understand it. Some stories you tell to some people in some places. Not any other spaces, not with any other people, but at that place and time. And when I discovered that, I understood that the work I do is sacred because I'm bearing stories. And even though those stories after the stop button aren't recorded, they are told. And it's something about people telling you about the trauma they've experienced in their lives. The abuse they, they're still struggling with. The, the joys that make them get up every day. The ways in which spending time just reflecting upon their story the past 30, 60, 90 minutes or so made them think about how they could do something differently. Sometimes there are some people in some places you got to get with and you got to tell your story. You don't need to tell your story to everybody. It doesn't have to be broadcast over the world. But it's important to tell your story. The writer Grant Hansberry said, she said, once you come to the point of determining that you're going to tell your story, then it's a matter of determining how much. Firstly, you have a story. Antioch East has a story connected with you. How many people know that beautiful story? Are you marketing your story well so people would be amazed when they understand the history of this beautiful building? In, in our time of personal announcements, we heard snippets uh, suggestions of stories that I'd like to hear more. I'd like to hear more about Uncle Emerson and his journey in this world. I'd like to hear more about how 19 years uh, a feline can be a companion and a friend. I'd like to know, to know more about how five, four decades of nursing and friendship shapes the way one can move in the world. There's so many stories in this room that if we would take the time and share them, they can be bread to us. They can feed our souls and our lives. This week I challenge you, find someone to tell your story to. Stories are healing, stories are life affirming, stories are the things that make it possible for some of us just to make it another day because we know someone else has been through what we've been through. As always, I am honored when I have the chance to talk to people and to share stories. And as I tell my guests of the Zami Nobla podcast, thank you for being a part of my Black Lesbian Herstory.
Have a sweet one. so many more things from podcasting. Those were just a few. And as promised, here is the outtake from the episode we did with Marissa Penderman. One of the things that that I know about you is that outside of the box we put people in, Mm -hmm. in their religious belief or whatever they choose to be their faith, is this place of abundant love and grace and hospitality. Mm-hmm. And that is shared by people of many faiths and mm-hmm. people who don't um, um, ascribe right. to any That's faith, right. so to speak. That's right. And so as I'm hearing you talk, even though we've been using this language, I just, it, it always flows from you every time I see you, this mm-hmm. abundant love, this abundant <laughs> hospitality, this vulnerability and this generosity a person. And I'm just curious, has that always been who you, who you were? Because <laughs> it seems so natural. You know what? It's work. You know, Angela, I, um, it's, you know, I decided, you know, that I wanted to be that. I'm so glad that you described me that way. I love it when you talk about me because you're so gracious in your words. <laughs> But I, I want to be that. And um, like all the time, as my dad would say, even when nobody's looking, mm. I want to be that. And so I want, so I really do um, practice that, you know, and I and I'm not, I don't get it right all the time, but I practice it. And it hasn't always been the case. I was a terrible child. Oh. Ask anybody who knew me. I spent all my time in the principal's office. I was suspended as much as I was in school. All the, you know, people in the neighborhood would be like, I'm sorry, your mama when she get home. And uh, I think in fifth grade, I probably got a whooping every day. My mom would be like, let's, you're getting a whooping. I don't even want to hear what you did yet, but you're getting a whooping. (laughs) (laughs) And I was mischievous. I would do things like ring people's doorbells and run, you know, older people that couldn't get to the door. So it would take them some time to get to the door and then I would, then there would be no one there. You know, just me. I was, I was um, mean um, and mischievous and uh, a neck rolling cussing little girl that used to practice my cuss words in the mirror. (laughs) Wow. And all of it was, you know, it was all of it was a response to trauma. I had some early um, physical and sexual abuse as a child, and um, and I was I, I, I held a lot of trauma in my body. And when I was seven, I was hit by a drunk driver, and I literally um, was incapacitated. Couldn't go to school for a year. Wasn't expected to walk well. All of those things, and um, and that's and I'm epileptic now, and and um, the story is that what the doctors believe is that I sustained a head injury during that accident that later keloided in my brain in a way that causes the epilepsy. Mm. Um, but um, but that accident, um, you know, added to trauma that I had it by then already experienced. And so, um, so my trauma response was mean, you know, just, I'm just going to be meaner than you can be to me. And, um, and, um, you know, I've always lived in these, you know, liminal spaces. And so, and I had this world where, um, on my, I would spend my summers with my grandmother who, um, loved God deeply and um and when i think about her you know love was more her religion than anything and she lived it in a really practical way and at one point i just decided i just want to be that i want to be like i don't want to sing songs that i don't live out i don't want to be in church on sunday saying things and 
memorizing things that I'm not living in the world. I don't even know when I made that decision, but once I did, everything pointed toward that, you know. And so, so yeah, it's intentional, and it hasn't always been. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a beautiful thing, and it comes out so freely from your soul that we would always assume you'd always been that way. <laughs> Wasn't that a great outtake with Marissa Penderman? She shared so much great stuff about choosing to do the work of being all that you can be and what that really takes. I hope there was something in her words that struck a chord with you today because it certainly did with me. The practice of being better is just that. A practice. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have any comments or you want to give some feedback, feel free to send us an email or leave your comments and feedback wherever you listen to the podcast. In the meantime, we are on schedule for another exciting release soon. So keep your ears to the ground. And as always, thanks for listening. Have a sweet one. Hey